Hi there. In this lecture, we're going to see an amazing high level example of the E5 pawn chain and how things can actually get very tactical. Sometimes you can start losing parts of the pawn chain, but as long as you have peace pressure to replace occupation, this was a Nimzovetchi in principle, and sometimes you can even give away your center as long as you're controlling central squares with your pieces. We're going to see an echo of that Nimzovetchi idea here. This is Mikhail Tau against Mikhail Botvinnik, the 1962, 1962, 1960 World Championship match, round one. Tau plays e4, e6 from Botvinnik. We see d4, d5, knight c3, bishop b4, e5, the winner variation. So white gets the bishop without the counterpart and plays the sharp move queen g4. This is theoretical. f5 protecting g7. The queen drops back. Knight e7. And this is basically a gambit. Tau takes up the gambit. Queen takes g7. And then queen takes h7. C takes d4. Now the move king d1. Very, very interesting move indeed. We see bishop d7. Here, if queen takes c3, so you can see that you know white's pawn chain is being dismantled. Nevertheless, white still stands strong in terms of pressure of pieces and central control through that pressure. And if D takes C3, again, you know, white stands well here because of the dark square play and pressure. There is enough compensation here for white. White doesn't have to literally occupy the center. We see Bishop D7, we see Queen H5 check, Knight G6, Knight E2, and here, things get sharp with d3. Yes, very interesting game now. c takes bishop a4 check, king e1, and yeah, the e5 spearhead. There's no uh, necessity always to maintain this. There are other advantages now in the position. So white's bishop pair, the the dark square in play in particular is impressive and there's a potential h pawn so even though it looks a bit crazy to do this and white is basically also a pawn up uh it's it's good for white here bishop g5 knight c6 d4 so okay after queen c7 we see h4 e5 and again the pawn chain is attacked at d4 rook h3 bringing the rook into the game and now d takes e5, and we can see that the pawns are fragmented here, and white has even better control over the adjacent dark squares. And we see rook e3, king d7, the bishop stops castling queenside, so king d7, rook d1, sorry, rook b1, b6, and we see knight f4, Rook a e8, rook b4. This is really interesting rook play for Mikhail Tal in this game. Bishop c6, and the queen actually drops back. Knight takes, rook takes, knight g6, and the rook goes back to d4. Yeah, this is just really interesting how white's pawn chain has been largely dissolved, and yet white has a lot of pressure on the center in fact d5 i mean this looks like a major liability with the king on d7 we see rook takes e3 f takes e3 so not indulging the possibility of even giving black potential tempos uh, with f4 for example we see you know this trying to add even more grip to the dark squares and c4 looks to be definitely on the cards here so this is a very dramatic example where sometimes, you know, there are options of just giving up the pawn chain for other advantages, peace pressure. We see king c7, c4, and there's a huge amount of peace pressure. Now on d5, we see d takes, bishop takes c4, queen g7. Yeah, this is just uh, what, what could black do here about d5? d8 is controlled. Uh, it's just very, very dangerous. Black doesn't want to give up this pawn. I mean, it's, it looks very bad to give up the pawn. So black gives up an exchange instead, but it's hopeless after h5. So at move 32, Mikhail Botvinnik resigned.
So that's this is a very, very high level, pretty complex example of the E5 pawn chain. The main philosophical points I would like to make with this example echoes, you know, Nimzovich that you don't always have to literally occupy the center. You don't have to keep the pawn chain intact. You can get other advantages sometimes. So be a bit flexible in the thinking there. And you know, the object is to win, not necessarily to maintain this, you know, big pawn chain construction. It might seem like a responsibility, but, uh, you know, there are other advantages to chase up in the position, like this G7 pawn. This gambit is a bit sharp. You really need to know quite a few stem games, perhaps, to play to take on G7. It is a bit scary uh, to be behind the development. But, yeah, nevertheless, it's an interesting example for that particular point about sometimes letting it be dissolved a little in exchange for other advantages. Okay, thanks very much. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the free sample from my ultimate guide to chess pawn structures, where I really enjoyed gaining a lot of insight for myself and sharing with you guys about various different key structures which you should know about, isolated pawns, backward pawns, hanging pawns, I even talk about form pawns, and this actually has a mammoth 45 plus hours of video content in this course, and you can get it at a discount as well with the standard voucher code, which is on Kingcrusher TV slash pawns. So I hope you do check out this pawn structure course. It's given me a lot of confidence to know fundamentally what's going on. Helps with you know getting a template plan quite easily just based on the pawn structure cues of a chess position. Okay, so I do hope you check that out. Thanks very much.